my body is not a form of currency. She does not exist for transactions to take place inside of her. My body is not a commodity. She was not born to be bought or sold by anyone. I have spent years discovering how to love this body and be entirely at home here, and no one gets to make this body about themselves instead. No one purchases her. She is not property. She does not exist to give anyone status or satisfaction. She is here to house me, all of me, at once, somehow, because I don't know how she does it. There's so much of me within her that she holds with such honor and resilience. I am so proud of her. My body is not a billboard. You do not get to slice her up in images to sell products that are only intended to make her hate herself again. You do not validate her. You do not violate her. And she does not need your permission to be here. But what you do not understand is that it will never, ever not be dangerous just having this body. Just living here. Drunk or sober, naked or clothed, crowded room or entirely alone, which you could not understand is that it will never not be dangerous here, ever. Because you've traded us too many times for us to even know where to begin to buy ourselves back. You've taught us too many years that we only exist through our relational proximity to someone else. What if she was your daughter, mother, sister, wife, never just a woman, never just a someone of her own? Well, we daughters, mothers, sisters, wives, we women, we are exhausted in these bodies. We are tired of holding our keys a certain way, squeezing our legs a certain way, tugging our skirts, our shirts, our hearts right out of our fucking chest every single time we try to tell you that we get to be here. Our bodies just get to be here. We are tired and afraid and braver than you will ever know. We are warriors in plain clothes, performing cultural defiance just to come home, unraveling every appearance just to occupy our own selves, just allowing ourselves to stay. We binge, we purge, we tuck, we scrape, we pluck, we pull, we cut, and you tug at us, tear at us, take us when you want to, and tell us we should have just had a little less to drink, no. This body is the first being I was given to learn to love. And she is the last one that I will leave with. I was born with her. I will die with her. But everything I ever learned about being a woman in this world has told me that in the meanwhile, I should leave her, hate her, or surrender her to someone else. No, this body is better than any of your excuses, so fuck you and your failed attempts to separate me from her. I will belong to her, and I will love her if it is the last thing I do, because loving her is the last thing that I will ever do. I'm a pretty empathetic person, but I can never fully understand what it would be like to be a woman living inside of many religious environments. There's such an emphasis, I, I mean, honestly, an obsession that a lot of religious groups have with sex, purity culture, and patriarchy. And the rules are always different for women. They're often told not to speak, have leadership, and they're judged by their appearance. After one outfit, they could gain a reputation. And the pressure to be a virgin, it, honestly, that shit is creepy. The white sheets, the hymen checks, all of this. There's Men would never have to deal with this. So we wanted to hear about this experience from a woman. Chuck and I have a friend, Jamie Lee Finch, who lives in Nashville. So we took the show to her. And here's our conversation with Jamie. Welcome to the Life After. Um, I'm Brady Harden. And I'm Chuck Parson. And we have a special guest today. Yes. So this Jamie, is a special episode. This is a very special episode. We're going to talk a lot about sex and sexuality. Sex. Yes. Um, Jamie was sex. a mutual friend of ours. Yes. Um, she was like a Venn diagram. She's right in the middle of our friendship. Yes, yeah, she is. Yeah. She's just right there um, in so the middle of all of my friends. I didn't know her super well, but I remember going to your all's uh, your all's shows for your for your band for the band. Yeah. yeah. And I saw her car once. 
and the bumper sticker had a coexist bumper sticker. Yes. And yes. it made me so uncomfortable for the longest time. Right, 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 right. Because I was that conservative. I know how you feel. It's bad news. That is bad news. Imagine but how we it learned, felt. didn't we? She was we ahead learned. of the curve. She was ahead Imagine of the curve. Imagine how it felt having that bumper sticker on your car when you went to a Christian high school. And, oh and also, intentionally, you had a personalized license plate that said Romans 12 because you just really wanted to fuck with people. Everybody, I'd like to welcome <laughs> Jamie Levinch. Hi. <laughs> Here, Here she I am. is. <laughs> <laughs> Best Perfect. Intro ever. So uh, we had, I had a privilege. I want to share this real quick. I had the privilege of, um, Jamie has been doing some research into purity culture. Yes. And uh, that requires reading some pretty, some pretty gnarly literature, oh, God, yeah. right? Some pretty triggering, heavy, like very misogynist, very... Uh, yeah, purity culture, right? Joshua Just like, Harrisonian bullshit. Yes, yes, <laughs> exactly. So she's been reading through this this book, Bringing Up Girls, Ugh. by Dr. James Dobson. And it, <clears throat> I was flipping through her notes. She sort of shared some of her notes with us. And I was... Notes being the things marginal. I write angrily in the yes, margin. Like literally she's writing these words in the margin so hard that they're pressing into the next page. <laughs> in one of the... so. Uh, one of the notes that I read on the side that I particularly appreciated said, damn fucking right. I'm your worst nightmare. (laughs) And that is who we're dealing with today. Just so everybody knows. You hear that James Dobson? I'm coming for you. He is. McGee and me can't sit you now. Shaking in his, in his (laughs) Jesus boots. (laughs) Shaking in his his Southern Baptist, uh, focus on the family boots out there. Somebody call wits end because it's going to burn down. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I mean, aggressive women are dangerous. You all are. Yes. You know? You all yeah. are. And I wouldn't have it any other way. No, I know. I me either. either. Most, most heterosexual men wouldn't, but that's the secret. Yeah. <laughs> can, we, can we start off by defining exactly what purity culture is? I feel like Jamie will probably do that. Exactly. And that's why, we, that's why <laughs> you you're here. You both hearing. just stare. And <laughs> Tell back us. to you, Jamie. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, yeah, let's dive right in. So um, purity culture, it is, it's it's one of those things where it's a little bit hard to explain because for people who didn't, for people who experienced it, they don't need an explanation. True. And for people who didn't experience it, it's so fucking wild that any way that you would try and explain it, because it's just so completely not human. Mm-hmm. It's very <clears throat> it's non-intuitive. Very, it's very non-intuitive. It's very... Um, it pushes back on everything it means to be a human person, um, and to grow and to evolve and to, yeah, I get just to grow, to grow up inside of your body and to experience adolescence and to experience adulthood. It's just, it's just very backwards. So the, um, from a woman's perspective, from my perspective of what I went through with purity culture, the crux of it is, um, it's it's centered around virginity because another name for purity culture is virginity culture. Um, the way that I, I speak about it in a lot of my research and my writing and the work that I do, um, academically and professionally with the women that I work with, um, I kind of broaden it out to religious and cultural sexual suppression. And whenever I'm writing pre-writing papers, I just have to acronym the shit out of that because it's way too long. Right. So it's just R C S S all the time. So, um, and I say it that way because something like purity culture is confusing, but the moment that I say religious and cultural sexual suppression, you kind of already know what I'm talking about. But for those of us who were raised in this kind of way with the Dr. James Dobson and the Joshua Harris and all of that, it did have a very specific title and a very specific term that those of us who are trying to find solidarity with one another since coming out of it, it's kind of like, you're in a dark room and someone holds up a flashlight and you know where they are. So when mm. someone else uses the term purity, cult- purity culture, you know where they are because you know where they've been. Right. And that's a really helpful thing. Um, but so basically it's just <clears throat> the experience of not being allowed to, there is a within fundamentalist religion and a lot of times within puritanical American culture as well, which the intersection of those two things can be very confusing. Um, just as a little side tangent here, um, because a lot as you, both know, and as all of our listeners kind of know, there's a sense of pride within fundamentalist evangelicalism Mm -hmm. that you are separate from culture. Culture is evil. But for women, we're receiving the message from culture that our bodies are either dangerous or desirable, and that feels dangerous. Uh, So from just regular culture, but then also this puritanical kind of 
nonsense that we have in American culture, um, which is that the right kind of woman is sexualized, but not sexual. Wow. And then you have on the opposite end of that, this answer that fundamentalist religion tries to give in saying, oh, we value women by saying that you are more than just your sexuality. But what they're actually saying is you are not at all your sexuality. You're none of your sexuality. Mm. And so the purity culture, the sexual suppression that occurs is in those those tiny little subtle indoctrinations God, that yes. girls um, experience when they're growing up in youth group where they're given these, I mean, it's on the cover of this fucking book. Like they're given these the illustrations flower. where There's they hold, a flower up, a, a flower they hold up a flower and you yeah. say, you tell a woman that every time she has sex, that a petal of the flower comes off. And then the, because the, the bottom line, the implication is marriage is the goal because a woman is yeah. not a, a woman. She is a wife, essentially. Mm-hmm. That's that's how you succeed within this, you know, evangelical narrative. I remember a, an analogy that that was given to me was a was like tape, right? I mm-hmm. think a lot of people have heard this. Oh, like there's a piece tape, of tape. There's gum. And you st- and you, if you take it off the <clears throat> roll and stick it to something, yeah. And you take it off, and it's less sticky. It's and each less time sticky. you stick it to something, it becomes less and less which sticky. Which yeah. Which is not at all how sexuality works. Which is essentially works. telling like, you actually, your ability to couple your ability to yes. build a successful partnership with someone, right. um, which is a completely opposite non, skill set than, than yeah. sex. It's totally opposite. Right. What, what they're telling you, because you're reduced solely to the fe- to your identity through whether you have sex or don't have sex, and the way to succeed is by not having sex. So when that's the filter, everything you're being told as a girl and as a teenager and as, as an adolescent, when that everything is going through that filter of your identity is solely based in sex, um, that whole idea of, well, you're going to lose your stickiness. You're not going to be able to couple. Everything's an attraction. Everything is going from the, the thing that I grew up with was always your heart. You always have mm-hmm. little pieces of your heart that you can yeah. only give out. And so the whole concept though, is that you're becoming less and less of a person. You're less and less valuable, yeah. less and less desirable depending on how many people you're with. Yeah. Um, even romantically from like, even just like a non-sexual. Yes. And that's thing, a lot but. of the, the extra layer of, um, the, so there's the sexual side and the intimate side. Um, and so a lot of Joshua Harris says nonsense was the whole don't even date because mm. that's still too far. Right. So I remember the school, the, the school that I went to, the Christian school I went to, um, <clears throat> for high school, so many of the people that I went to high school with and the churches that they represented, you know, the churches they went to being in that high school, um, courtship was a huge thing. And it was the, Oh, I don't, it's wildly absurd to think about now because I'm 29 years old and I'm still not in the position where I'd be ready to marry a person much right. less when I was 17. And the rhetoric was, well, don't date unless you're ready to marry that person. Right. Are right, you kidding right. me? Yeah, so yeah. no wonder the divorce rate among evangelical Christians is actually higher. Right. On the whole, the it, 90s, yeah, right? then yeah. it's actually yeah. higher than you know mainstream culture. This evil, evil thing that they're told that they tell you to that number. Congratulations, I mean, I did, both of you, and I did too. And, and it's it. it's weird looking back at it because I did everything absolutely right yeah. compared to these books. I grew up in a very um, oh, so did I. I courted. I asked permission before I dated or courted my ex-wife, um, even before I married her. Obviously, so I did all that. I saved myself for marriage. I didn't have sex till I was married because I took the whole pledge of true love weights and everything like that. Um, oh and then the difficult part was I, I don't share this story very often. And I knew today that it would come up, but um, I was engaged before I got married. I was engaged mm. to another woman right. and I broke it off because um, I read what the Bible had to teach on remarriage and she had been married before <gasps> and broke off that wedding. And wow. that really, really honestly haunts me. Um, and I don't know what the appropriate way to reconcile that is with her. I don't even know where she is anymore. I know she got remarried um, mm-hmm. and she's a lot happier. Um, it might not be necessary. It may not be necessary, reckon, but yeah. I, I, you know, there's guilt there because sure. I can't imagine the guilt and the shame that she had. Mm. Um, I mean, I yeah, think we weird. all, I mean, I wow. think uh, yeah. in addition to the, the damage, the internal damage, I think that the purity culture does to us. I think, I think most people, that were at least that were really dedicated to it have some kind of like story like that, right? Where they hurt somebody else because mm-hmm. they were so devoted to this system, right? Like oh, you well, broke because... up with a girlfriend because you went too yes. far, right? Or you know, like, or you 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 were like, oh, you're a bad influence on me. Like you made this other person feel shame, yeah, 
um, because they were being a normal human and you were trying to repress your mm-hmm. <laughs> sexuality. Right. right. And, and like, yeah, I, I totally, yeah, I have, I have those same kind of things that I carry around, you know? And the weird thing is I thought it would fix me from being gay. You know, mm-hmm. that if I went all these things that I would have a decent marriage. If you well. stuck to the rules stuck and to if the you rules. did everything correctly. And that's one of the biggest things is it's a, it's a formula. Yes. It's, mm-hmm. it's a virginity plus purity plus not giving yourself away equals f- infinite forever. sexual fulfillment, yes. fulfillment, <laughs> infinite right. relational it's fulfillment. The, it's what we were, you know, discussing since you guys have been here for the last, what, like only like 12 hours or something. Mm-hmm. We, we got a lot in. in we got a lot hours, of, we yeah. had a lot of conversations and just that when we were um, circling around that idea of what fundamentalism offers, that is an illusion, but they do a really good job pitching it is this, this idea of arrival mm-hmm. that there's a safe place because there's somewhere that you can arrive and the yes. black and white formulas, the two plus two absolutely always equals four are the only stories you ever hear on the inside. Yeah. So you only ever hear the success stories. So you hear the stories of well, we waited until marriage and we did all these things right. And now we have this amazing, vibrant, wonderful sex life. Right. And it's so fulfilling. And we have these kids and it's great. And and you have, and I'm, I, I, it's not my job, nor is it my goal or desire to tell people that their lived and felt emotional experience is incorrect. But what is my desire is to dismantle a system that's been lying to them. And it's very, very possible that they could be happy in where keeping to the rules got them to, but it's not the rules that got them there. It's not attributed to the rules at all. Just in the same way that when a marriage fails, that's a poor way to even say that when a marriage ends, it doesn't mean it failed. That doesn't mean that at all. It just means that conscious uncoupling is a thing. Perpetuity is never the goal or the guarantee or necessarily what we should be. I don't know. Um, orienting ourselves toward, towards um it is experience is the point Mm -hmm. and learning lessons is the point and so you have these really enlightened individuals who are um i think maybe you posted something about divorce selfies um was that you (laughs) no but i I love this well divorce selfies are a thing and i'm loving Uh them and people in my life are really confused as to why i'm just like crying happy tears over seeing this and it's because these are people who are saying uh, well, it's just selfies people are taking on the day that they're divorced. That they're papers divorced and it's yeah. the couple together. And right? they're yeah. so stoked for one another. Right. And they're like, you're yeah. still my best friend and I wish nothing but the best for you. Right. And the thing is, is like inside of the church, did we ever no. hear that? that no, no, we never no, heard no, that. No, no, no. Because the problem is, is if you tell people that that's an option or you let them entertain the idea that that's an option, you can't control them into fitting into your narrative. Mm. So, I mean, is it, with my ex-wife and I, you know, we're raising our child together. He's going to be five in July. And uh, there's no way that her and I can get along the way that we did until we kind of got some influences from outside mm-hmm. of the church. For me, it was cutting off from that. For her, um, she had a coworker who was gay. Um, and I think it helped kind of clear up some ideology behind and and homophobia. But now, I mean, we're, we're huge supporters of each other Mm -hmm. and um, because of our son and with my parents uh, and, and I don't know if it was just, their culture if it had to do with the the Christianity or whatever like they, they had to be enemies they had to go to different churches mm-hmm. they had to yeah you know yep. everybody had to take sides within the church yeah um, and I just it was very 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 unhealthy and that's the thing that I think bothers me the most is is the fact that the reality bringing this back around to the religious and cultural sexual suppression idea is that the fact that I am an unmarried 29 year old woman, who is very comfortable. It's, it's wild that I'm like, isn't it crazy that I'm a unmarried 29 year old woman who's comfortable having a sex life? Right, like, right, right. it's weird that that's a weird thing to say. I feel but, it, exactly the same way. Right? And yeah. what's fascinating is that the way that we are raised and the way that, you know, the things in this book are talking about and saying uh, is basically I should be miserable, <laughs> which is laughable Yeah, yeah, yeah. because apparently I'm a chewed up piece of gum. Or I'm right. overused tape, or I'm right. a flower with definitely no petals left. Yeah. Like it's this strange commodity mo- model definitely where no definitely petals. no yeah. petals left. <laughs> it's a strange thing where my my value and and the thing that I really want to make sure I say about this is I one of the most important books that I read on all of this is um, Jessica Valenti's The Purity Myth. Okay, mm-hmm. and um, she talks about in that where. It, when you really zoom out and you really think about this obsession with virginity um, for women and this obsession with like controlling their purity, which again is just like an 
inane, totally insane term to use in the first place because if you think about it, purity is the measure of an object. So what does that tell you about our experience of women right, right, um, right. <clears throat> not being humans, being objects? But her whole thing is like, what it tells you is that apparently the more that you have sex, the less value sex has for you mm. is what purity culture is trying to tell you. Right. Now, is that true that's, about that's anything else in this world? Opposite. But not even sex. Oh, is that true anything for else. anything else in this whole oh, wow, world? Right, the right. more you do something, the better you are in the, that activity. The more you appreciate the The more you appreciate it. it. Yeah. The more you love it. The you better you become in it. You explore and, new things. Yeah. You learn new things. Right. You experience. You grow. You taste. You yeah. expand. Like, and And the fear that fundamentalist religion has in its necessity to control people because sexuality is so powerful and because the feminine is so powerful that if you give women access to that part of themselves, that's going to burn the patriarchy down. And that's what they're so afraid of. It's built on that's what they're so afraid of. Built on so, fear and shame. Yes. And so they have to lie to you and tell you that you lose value right. by knowing yourself sexually. Okay. And what I'm here to communicate is you actually gain value by knowing that very valid, integrative, important, beautiful part of yourself. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is this sense of, I know that I'm here to do this work because in the reality of my experience with sex and even my experience of masturbation and my experience of self-pleasure or my experience of you know, just the way that I've had sex and, and the people I've had sex with, not ever at any point, even when I was still inside of Christianity, and I was still a part of that narrative. Did I ever feel shame? Mm -hmm. I remember the first time that I had sex when I was 19, 18, 19 with my <clears throat> boyfriend at the time. And I remember talking with two friends literally right after it happened, like the day after it happened. And I will say too, I feel very, very, I hate that I use the word lucky with this because the number of women that I've talked to, their first sexual experiences are hardly positive. Absolutely. Right. And the, the man that I was with at the time, um, I was not, he was my first, but I was not his first. And he was very open with me about, um, his previous relationships. And he was, he was also bisexual. And so he was very open. He had done a lot of that personal work to explore. And so how old was he at the time? He was 22. Ooh. That's amazing. Uh, no, older no, I'm saying, like, I really wish it? I had my, my shit together like that as a 22 year old, you know, I, I, I respect that. Yeah, I was, I was getting, I was a virgin getting married when I was 22 and I was about to wreck a couple of people's lives. <laughs> You're all doing <laughs> weird shit at 22. But I mean, we he had weird out. shit going on too, but this is just one area <laughs> so of his life where he's Jamie, that actually, but that's I a... hate that I have, you know, I'm calling it lucky um, because he and I had conversation completely surrounding consent. Um, and so basically when I, when we got to the point where we're like, we are in a committed relationship with one another, he's aware of this about me. He's aware that I've never had sex before. He's aware of the weight of that being a, a sacred thing that you share with another person. So we had these conversations and then when it came down to it and it was the right moment for me, he got consent from me every couple of minutes to make sure that I was still comfortable. I was still okay. And this is still good. Wow. I felt so safe and it was so beautiful. And then I remember just feeling the the story I had been told throughout my entire experience in youth group is like, you're going to wake up the next day and feel different. You're going to yes, feel like less yes, of yourself. Yes. I woke up the next day and just felt like more of myself. Mm -hmm. And then what happened is I went and had some drinks with some gal pals um, who were other Christian gal pals. And we sat down and I was just real, I like I always have been, was just really open and was like, guess what, y'all? This is what happened. And they both just had this sunken look on their face. Mm -hmm. And one of them looked at me and was like, well, Jamie, you know what this means now, don't you? And I was like, no, I... I have no idea what it means. That what does it do mean? It again? And she, yeah, that it was awesome <laughs> and I plan on doing this forever. And she, she just had this, she was so scared all of a sudden for right, me. Like right. I was a completely different person. And she said something to the effect of, well, it means now, and she verbally towed the party line. And she basically said, it means that a piece of your heart is essentially telling me what this means is that you feel this way now, even you though I entered, shame. you yeah. should feel this way. Her, she was putting on me like the, what this means is that you feel this way now, don't you? Kind of a weird thing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't feel that way at all. And it wasn't until realizing, and this is true. I'm not kidding you. I can't think of a single exception 
any woman that I've talked to in the work that I've done, this is true across the board, where we didn't feel shame after a sexual experience. We felt shame in our expression of having that sexual experience, and then we met with the friction of other people's expectation of the way we should feel, or the okay. shame in our heads of the way that we are taught how we should feel, yeah. that then we talked ourselves into, and this is subconscious, it's not happening consciously, we talked ourselves into feeling shame. Mm -hmm. wow. So we actually felt shame over the fact that we didn't feel shame. And it's that's how... That's how cult works. They, yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. It's just that whole mentality of trying to tell you how you feel, and if you're not feeling that way, I mean, I experienced there's something that wrong with you as a gay man. The mm -hmm. first time that I, you know, did anything with a guy, um, it was you know after my marriage and everything, and I, at the end, thought I would feel that shame, that horrible shame. But yeah. I literally, I woke up, um, went to the mirror, gave myself a high five in the bathroom, Hell yeah, and and was able to make eye contact and just said, "This is who you've always been." Oh yeah. Yes. And I was even like practicing yeah. Christian at the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it was very it's different. It's like because your sexuality is such a valid part of you, it's as if you didn't have access to your right arm for right. 20 years. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you wake up one day and, it grew and there. you can use it. Well, <laughs> it was always there, it. but you yeah. had no feeling in it. Right. You had no access to your experience of occupying and living inside of your right arm. And then you wake up one day and you're like, yeah. I can use this for yeah, yeah. so many things. And you just feel more whole and more complete. And that's the reality of sexuality. Not what purity culture is telling people. Not what fundamentalist religion is telling people is that you are less you by engaging in your sexuality. Wow. And how much more can you accomplish with two arms right? right like how much more yeah like capable of sexually right? capable or just of in so general much more. <laughs> <laughs> i mean i use two hands for anyway on that note um we need to take a short break when we get back um we're gonna have we're all gonna have two arms we're, we're gonna have two arms and uh <laughs> chuck i think you wanted to explore a little bit of what jamie's personal experience was with yeah. what it was like um growing up in that culture right. and some of the stories that she may have. Is that right? Absolutely. All right, let's okay. do that. Uh, let's take a short break. We'll be right back. The Life After Facebook page is a great way to get in touch with other religion survivors. Also, we like to post interesting articles on there. And it's a good way to get a hold of us. And you won't need a concordance to find us. <laughs> we... <laughs> We have a link to the Facebook page on our website, thelifeafter.org, or search The Life After on Facebook. Finally, you could just go to our URL, facebook.com slash thelifeafterorg. Wild and wondrous woman, this world has spread itself before you as a banquet on a table of your own making, and I need you to know it's okay to be hungry for it. It's okay to be as hungry as you are, to be ravenous over the possibilities, the potential, the promise of it all. Don't you dare feel ashamed of your glorious appetite, what is cavernous and craving within you. You are here to feast. You are here to be fed and filled and so much more than simply satisfied. Wild and wondrous woman, no, you were not given a hunger so that you would starve. Everybody, welcome back to The Life After. Um, everybody who's here, uh, I'm going to count to three and just say your name. One, two, three. Brittany Lee Vint. All right. Oh, we weren't doing the whole name. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Brittany Lee Harden. One, two, three. Brittany Harden. Brittany Lee Harden. One, two, three. <laughs> um, <laughs> one thing we were talking about over the break. It, you know what? This feels like a real talk show <laughs> where you know, really they, they have that really fake chatter in between segments like mm -hmm. you'd go to commercial and you're always like what are they talking about but here's <laughs> what we were talking here's what yes, we were talking about where you can about. see them but you can't hear them um and then after this i, I want to hear more of like your personal story of what your purity culture experience was um there was it, it came to, to my attention that one of the problems is body image issues mm -hmm. that has come as a gay man that's a huge thing in our gay community as, as a woman absolutely um and i don't want to leave you out chuck like Sorry, chuck. is that something that you've <laughs> Do you think a lot of straight men deal with that and just don't talk about it? Or yes, lots work? of straight yeah. men deal with yes. it and don't talk about it. Yeah, okay. definitely. Mm -hmm. That's not something that I've personally struggled with, so I'm sort of out of this conversation. But uh, every, I mean, everybody in, everybody this, in this culture who has a body. Right? Yeah, <laughs> no, but one of the big things that I think a lot of us deal with with body image issues is because we we have to keep ourselves from from all of the sex and everything and the sexual desire all and of the all and the sexes <laughs> give it away. Um, but what is for, for men at least, what is our, our, our scapegoat is pornography right. and creates, mm. you know, if this is all we're exposing our to ourselves to for the first 
20 something years of our lives mm-hmm. until we're actually able to do it on our own. Um, it's going to create some bullshit in our heads. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not saying that pornography is bad, uh, but what I am saying is whenever it is your only outlet, um, it is mm-hmm. creating yes. some really messed up. So then, mm-hmm. so then men, you know, we're told we can't look at porn and then we, our hormones are going crazy. Yeah. You know, if you believe God created our bodies, then he is setting you up for failure in this age range. Right. If you can't get married till you're in your mid to late twenties, yeah. but mm-hmm. your hormones yes. are firing off in your twenties. Yes. Or you could just believe that there, it's just, there is no God and there's just bio- biology, but that's Brady. a whole other story. Brady, <laughs> no, don't getting wild. That's know, crazy wild. talk. But I think that's a very difficult thing um, to deal with. And, also, another big thing, and this is where I want to go to your story, Jamie, is we're taught that women don't have sex drives growing up. You know, like right? it, it sounds stupid and outrageous. Uh, did you not know? We we don't. <laughs> you just like had drives to be in the kitchen oh, and make sandwiches bet. and shit. You bet. Yeah. Um, but that 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 we're that just sexism, we're just a walking, talking birth canal. Right. That's it. Obviously. <laughs> that's all. Right. But it's that okay. sexism that's within the church and is being propped up even more by the shame culture mm-hmm. um, is absolutely absurd. Yeah. What, what is your experience? What was that like growing up in that? <clears throat> wow. A loaded question. I know, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. It is. Um, hmm. What was it like growing up in that? Well, that's, it's such an interesting thing because you don't even really have the ability when you're in it, you don't you know. You can't step out you and can't. look in. You can't mm-hmm. get yeah. any perspective on it because it's right. just all that you have. I will say, though, that um, I don't know. It's it's such a strange thing in leaving religion um, and then kind of peering back at it. I still see a lot of pieces of my life that kind of what I was saying to you on the break where there's these things that have occurred in my life that I... I can't help but look back at them and think, oh, they're totally the reason why I'm here now. And I don't know who to attribute that to or what to attribute that to. Mm -hmm. Um, If there is a higher power or not, I'm kind of just super not concerned with dwelling on. Mm -hmm. It doesn't keep me up at night. Um, But I love thinking about synchronicity and serendipity and the the work that you're here for finding you kind of thing. So what purity culture and being raised in that way was like for me is that I didn't really, I didn't really ever buy their bullshit. Mm -hmm. Um, And my struggle was in the fact that because I wasn't actually really buying their bullshit, I had to keep that a secret. And because I, I mean, this is not, this is not, wild information or like a stunning concept because I was a teenager with a sex drive and I was strangely somehow very comfortable with that with myself, knowing that about myself, I felt like that was where my shame came from is because I had to keep that a secret. And Uh, I remember going back to like having shame that you didn't have shame that I didn't have shame. Yes. And I felt like I was maybe the only, I I felt honestly, my Mm. entire experience was that I must be the wrong kind of woman. Um, and I've I heard that so many times now, like from, I'm, I'm learning that from, from women that grew up in church. Yes. Yeah. Because I'm, we I'm all think that we're the wrong kind of, of woman. Yes. Mm-hmm. Cause apparently there is a right kind of woman to be, right. which, well, which there is isn't. one with no sex drive. Right? One with no sex drive. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. And the, the reality is, is that, um, so the word that I feel very comfortable using for that now is it's inhumane. That's, mm. that's absolutely inhumane. Mm-hmm. That is a violation of human rights right. in a way to try and, um, convince, manipulate, abuse women. It's, it's legitimately traumatic to abuse women into believing that the only way that they're acceptable is to beat their sexuality out of them or to shame their sexuality out of them. It is inhumane. I, one of the many threads that went wild on, on my Facebook a few months back, as they all tend to do whenever I post about women and sex, um, one of them was just like, here's your just gentle, casual Tuesday reminder that purity culture teaches adolescent girls that married the, you know, implication is heterosexual women. They're the only females that are allowed to have access to their sexual identity. Yeah. And that's not only completely nuts, but it's inhumane. Right. That's absolutely inhumane because what that does 
<clears throat> what that does is it, it lodges in your brain as something that you are supposed to assimilate to. That's the right way to be. And that is, that is absolutely traumatic. And so I definitely, in my personal experience, definitely had some of those things to, to rip out of my skull. But for the most part, it wasn't even so much because of the way that I was wired sexually. It was a lot to do with my personality is the reason why I was kind of always had this target on me as like, you're not really the right kind of woman because I am forceful and I'm intense and I'm communicative and I'm not demure and I'm not, you know, like I brought up before the, the scripture that one of my teachers at my high school used to reprimand me once, which was, uh, some scripture in somewhere in the new Testament that says something about how, when it comes to women, a gentle and quiet spirit is precious to God. And it was basically put to me that you don't have, you're not gentle and you're not quiet. So you should probably fix this about you. So I already kind of had the whole, but that is, let's bring this up to that is a part of purity culture as well is if you can get women to be so submissive that they hardly exist anymore, you can Mm -hmm. tell them anything Mm -hmm. about their sexuality. You Mm -hmm. can tell them anything about their identity. And so a woman who communicates the way that I communicate or is just marginally at all in any manner just more outspoken um, than what they're comfortable with, um, that's super dangerous. So because I kind of always felt like I was a little bit dangerous inside of it anyway, when it comes to my personal experience in purity culture, I kind of felt like these things were happening around me and I was observing it. Um, so what words would you associate? Um, Cause I, I'm thinking of two, two to this purity culture and mm-hmm. that experience that the first ones that come to my mind are obedient, submissive. Yes. What other ones would you add? I mean, for me, coming from the work and the research that I've done and do, dissociated. Wow. Um, <clears throat> and it, it kind of goes back to the whole, there's parts of your body you're not even able to access. Yes. And not physically, but all, like not just physically, but also mentally and emotionally. And yes. spiritually let's actually almost. unpack that because uh, I was reading some of your work and, and, um, and <clears throat> one of the, the things that really stood out to me was this concept of reconnecting with your body. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right. You were talking about so this last you night. Are, I found it so fascinating. You mm-hmm. are, uh, you're effectively saying uh, purity culture forces you to say, um, I am this, like this is the way that I interpret it, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's almost like you are a ghost floating, and wow. you're supposed to be this quiet ghost that in your body just serves this this external purpose, and you're not connected with it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that that's language for the sense of how it feels for a lot of women. Yeah. Um, where that comes from is the fact that already within fundamentalist religion, I mean, we all know it, we all heard it, the language of what body represents when you're raised inside of evangelicalism mm. is that body equals sin the or flesh. sin nature, the yes. flesh, it's bad. So you already have this indoctrination by way of repeated <clears throat> language. Mm-hmm. So we keep hearing over and over and over where you, you automatically... You autom- body and bad are automatically synonymous with one another. <clears throat> and then for women, for girls, we're also told all the time that it's our job to keep men pure, to keep yes. the boys in our youth group from right. lusting after us because they boys are just visual. They're just visual creatures. They can't help it's just it. what they do. They can't help it, which also that's extremely abusive right. exactly. to, in talking about males. Yeah. Um, but what you're telling women with that is, it's your, it's your job. So your body is so bad that it can't be trusted. And for me, I mean, you go for the best way to know how to put it is that, that was so, that felt so real for me. And it, it sat and stewed for such a long time that the breaking point for me, um, after my whole experience of, of leaving the cult that I left and, and having my life completely fall apart about three years ago, was that I found myself in this position where I was so dissociated from my own body and my eating disorder had gotten so out of control and I was so um, just a shell of a person that the way my brain was functioning was that I 
had to self-harm. I had to abuse myself in the form of overeating and binging and purging um, because I couldn't be trusted with a body that I was proud of. Uh Because if I had a body that I loved, I would do dangerous things with it. And when I hear myself say that now, with all the work that I've done and with how much I love her and she feels so sacred to me, it's it's devastating for me to know that I was waking up in the morning, mornings after these intense binges where I just wished I could exit my own body. And I would wake up in the morning and hate her so much that I wish I could slice off parts of her. I would have vivid images of me slicing all parts of my own body. Mm. And the reality is, is that is, it is no accident that I got there. It's no accident that I got there, that I thought she was so dangerous that she couldn't be healthy, that she was so dangerous that I couldn't make her strong and make her something that I was proud of and something that I loved. I've, you're firing all these synapses in my brain. Cause I mean, I've dealt, mm. uh, with body image issues, um, after my divorce since leaving the faith, I, I, gained a lot of weight and went through depression and just now am I getting in touch with my body again Mm -hmm. or for the first time honest honestly because you know growing up and as a a boy having the desires to masturbate uh was a huge ordeal and it was such a shame thing uh but also like body image shaming it it, I'm just now realizing how detrimental that was for me and is for other people that um, it's legitimately making you hate something about yourself that is yourself, that of is turning yourself. yourself against yes. yourself. You know what? Yes. What it was? Sorry, are, you, are you finished? Yes. I'm sorry, yeah. I don't want to cut you off. Okay, um, Kanye. <laughs> Yo, I'm gonna let you finish, but <laughs> but I'm actually not going. Dr. To let James finish. Dobson had one of the best period cultures of all time. Get rid of this book. Just sitting here on the table as an Dr. effigy James that I get Dobson to burn. Senior Taylor Swift. <laughs> it is. It is. I love so it. many levels. Um, I, I learned, uh, this is something I learned a few years ago and honestly, uh, I'm just now getting to the point where I feel like I'm breaking through this boundary, but, um, uh, purity culture for me, the way that the most tangible way that it manifested itself was that, um, if I, I noticed this thing where if I was romantically attracted to a girl, um, I, I was not capable of having sexual feelings towards her. You bet. Wow. And if I was yes. sexually... Yeah. If I had sexual feelings for a girl, I was not capable of being romantic yeah. because romantic is pure. Marriage is, <laughs> yep. relationships are yes. pure and, and sex and, and Sexual and attraction is evil. Is evil. It's mm-hmm. just and bad. And it's like, how can you put those two together? And that was a very, 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 very powerful complex yes. that actually contributed a lot to like my marriage failing and several other different relationships failing. I Learning, did the same thing as a guy that, uh, yeah. that I, I told myself, oh, I just... I'm attracted to guys because I, I just want to fool around. I don't want to actually, you know, be in a relationship. I can never yeah. be in a relationship with a guy. Mm. Um, and I told myself that I was going to divorce those two ideas um, because it mm. would be easier to deal with, oh, well, I struggle with this sort of lust instead of I actually struggle with identifying as with the integrating. That I was. Yes, integrating yeah. those two things. Um, and then I realized, no, and retrospectively, I... I did have feelings for some guys and I just had yeah. to ignore that. It was, yeah. it was like yeah. a part of me that I yeah. wanted to cut off and couldn't have. Which is so fascinating because purity culture claims that its end goal is to keep people from objectifying one another. Mm. When in reality, when you're not an integrated person and you can't mm-hmm. reconcile those two parts of yourself, what you were both just talking wow. about, what do you what end up doing? Body, you end up object. objectifying other people. When the, It's like you're shaking up a champagne bottle and it's just exploding. Yeah. So when your body's doing what it's going to do because you're a grown-ass fucking human person who is here to have sex, that's a part of your existence here as a human being. That's what you do. And so what that if you're not able to integrate the feelings of, or if you're not, if you don't have a working knowledge, this is a chart I have, which I can explain later, but if you're not able to integrate or you don't have a working knowledge of your sexual intelligence, your intimate intelligence and your erotic intelligence. And so therefore it's impossible to find sexual compatibility, intimate compatibility and erotic compatibility. All that you end up doing is just kind of hanging out in sexual compatibility when you are in the act of having sex with another person. But usually you're drunk. Usually you're on a substance oh that God. makes you brave Stop enough to actually do it in the first my place. Life away right you're now. welcome. So don't, don't worry. I have the chart. I could give Keep you the chart. Coming. So what that ends up doing is it ends up objectifying another person. 
Because you're not given the landscape, you're not given the permission to navigate the landscape in the first place of saying, what is it that I want? What is it that I'm looking for? Who am I here to be? Who am I here to be for another person? What do I want wow. another person to offer me? You, wow. you want to build something with someone and purity culture cuts you off and says, well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. No, no, no. You can't integrate your sexuality into your desire to build a partnership with someone until the day that you sign a piece of paper. That's fucking crazy. And yeah. what you were saying earlier about the ghost, I thought that was a great illustration. And I was thinking of the movie Casper, where he really wanted to be a real boy the whole time. Right. And, right. But it wasn't until like, you know, until the marriage that they they promised that ghost, well, finally you'll have a body and you'll be able to do Whoa. it. Yeah. But like, okay. let's look at sex inside of a marriage, though. Is still, there's, well, don't do that. Don't use those mm-hmm. things, you know? And there's still right. like... Well, you want to, I can go on, go on further for you with that. For women... Um, <laughs> the disgusting patriarchal, which I'm so sorry if this is important to any of you out there. I'm so sorry. But the disgusting patriarchal tradition of a father giving a bride away. Mm-hmm. First of all, what the hell? What is that? Second right. of all, yeah. here's the best way you know how to put this. This came to me one day and I was right. like, yeah. oh dear God. Um, a wedding, a wedding is like a magic show. You make a beautiful woman disappear. Because what happens Whoa. is women never yeah. actually get access to their own sexuality and their own sexual identity because under purity culture with this like nonsense, oh my God. Your, your virginity, your Shit. purity, your sense of your entire sense of morality is protected by your father. Why do you think a father walks a daughter down the aisle, even if she's 30 years old on the day of her wedding? My dad doesn't have to give me away. Gee, I haven't whoa. been protected by him in years. So he gives you away to a man. And the entire language is your sexuality now exists and belongs to that man. They do some lip service to, well, his belongs to you too. But for the yeah. most part, the submission language is I now belong to you. So yeah. never at any point in that, it's just an exchange. There's never a point in the middle where a woman's sexual experience and sexual identity and sexuality belongs to only her. No in, wonder in, in, you I mean, were so scary to them because you should not exist at all. Yes. I mean, exactly. I would take I would take that exactly. whole thing a step further and acknowledge mm-hmm. what very few Christians will acknowledge is that the culture that particularly the Old Testament, uh, you know, marriage, the the Old Testament idea of marriage comes from is that women are property. Yeah. That yeah. are, that are being exchanged mm. for something. Yes. Um, and that is a re that's real, you know, regardless that's why of, the I think term a lot of purity people, works anyway is because right. it's the measure of an object. Like, wow. just hang out with that first. That's so insane. Uh, and like the and virginity gold, isn't even or, a yeah. scientifically yeah. measurable thing. So right. virginity culture, purity culture, these things, like these are terms that we're using to talk about something that doesn't even exist. When really we could just throw the whole thing away and just talk about human beings being human beings. It seems so well, simple. And the, and the double standards are so ridiculous because I'm thinking also in... in I apologize if this is a trigger warning for any of our listeners, but uh, victims of sexual abuse, there's still such a shame for the woman Mm -hmm. um, who that's done to. And there's still this idea of, well, I'm worthless now because this happened to me. I I can't offer my virginity in that way. Yes. And, And all of this. And that is so fucking stupid and it's so fucking disgusting and it's got to stop um i I don't want my son's generation to have to live through that shit or to perpetuate that bullshit um and yeah everything just goes back to the value of the guy well oh boys will be boys and and Mm -hmm. and it just excuses us this the, the, the rape and excuses the sexual assault um i i I came and wrap my mind around how yeah. how we got here and why we got here and um, the the conscious of people that had to numb themselves and to keep quiet to to let our culture to get to where it is now and I think it is time for us to stand up and say no fucking more mm-hmm. this is not the bullshit that we're going to pass on to our daughters or to our sons um, it's got to stop here you have you have to upend patriarchy. Yeah, and fundamentalist religious belief, particularly evangelicalism here in the United States, benefits from patriarchy. So that's what you're actually up against. You're, the enemy isn't Christianity. The enemy isn't belief. The enemy of, or the culprit of what is causing these problems and this, disassoci- this dissociation and from my research and what I'm doing, the work that I'm doing and trying to prove what's causing sickness and disease and death in women because of the way that manifests physically, which we could get into later. The culprit that is causing those things is patriarchy that is propped up. And I don't really know which one props which one up, but fundamentalist religious belief 
and patriarchy work together to make a TP for suppression mm. of, of women. We do need to take a break. Um, when we get back, I would like to talk to you a little bit more about um, some of the advice that you give to these the young women that you that you are in interactions with um, and try to figure out how do we rebuild this in a way that's going to be good. Mm-hmm. Um, and it starts with us, individuals, um, in kind of little ways for yeah. we can do self-care and rebuild ourselves. Uh, we'll be right back right after this. Do you have a story you want to tell us? Or a question you want answered? Do you need advice on how to handle family members who are upset at you because you're wrestling with your beliefs or leaving your religion? Have you experienced some weird religious shit that you need to tell people that might actually get it? Then contact us. Go to thelifeafter.org, all one word, and click the Contact Us page. Or Facebook us at facebook.com backslash thelifeafterorg. Or email us at info at thelifeafter.org. We would love to hear hear from... uh, Let's do it together. Okay. One, two, three. We'd We'd love love to to hear hear from you. you. Or when you email us, send us a voice recording. We really like that too. I am holding so many of other people's stories within me that sometimes I wonder if I'll reach my limit and break, but instead, I just expand. And we're back. This is the life after, and we are here to smash the patriarchy. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) With our Doc Martens. Hot damn, with some, <laughs> some got our Doc Martens laced up, steel Smash toe. Smash them. Ready to go. Smash them. <laughs> right Jamie, the, you ready to smash the patriarchy? Right Every on. day. Every yes. day you yeah. wake up motivated. Yeah. All right, let's bust some balls. Usually my language for it is burn it to the ground, <laughs> I like but it. I can smash things too. I love it. Um, I want to get some advice from you. I feel like you've got a lot to give um, in that area because you work a lot with a lot of young women who um, have had to deal with a lot of this shit and um, they come to you. You've kind of become like a lighthouse for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, what kind of advice do you give uh, for different circumstances and stuff like that? So the best way that I've found to describe the work that I do and who I am within the work that I do is that I am a relationship therapist between women and their own bodies. Wow. And yeah, thank I like you. That. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that it felt like the truest way to describe what happens in the conversations that I'm having with, um, with my clients and with my friends and with my coworkers, but predominantly the way the conversations go with, with my clients, with the people that hire me. So, um, The way that, you know, religious and cultural sexual suppression comes into play with that is every woman that I've ever spoken to, much less worked with, um, or just been in the presence of, has a story about, or many stories, or just this overarching narrative of how her experience of not being given them permission to be a fully integrated human woman in the realm of her sexuality and that, that portion of her identity, um, plays into a lot of the struggles that she's having now. And the thing is, is a lot of my job in, in describing it as being a relationship therapist between women and their own bodies is I take the stories that they tell me. Um, and I, most of what I do is just create space and, um, give access and give permission by creating that space. And they'll talk about the issues or the struggles and it's veiled language that they don't even know is veiled. So when I first started doing this work, it was a lot of, I just want to lose 10 pounds or my hormones are out of balance because I am maybe to give context. I am an integrative health coach is the technical title of what I am, um, in school now to get some further education and further titles with that. Um, But so it started out in one way and it was a lot of body centric language of things that women were dissatisfied about. And yet when I was listening to them and we were working with one another, these common themes kept coming up and these common themes always circled around this um, theme. Yeah, the common theme was pretty much this idea that they didn't have access to their own sexuality. And that was always a part of their story of of Mm. how they got to where they are now. And I also saw a pretty consistent theme of, it's the only word I'm really thinking of to use now, but a pretty consistent theme of um, seeing the same 
I was seeing the same physical conditions over and over. So a lot of women who have autoimmune diseases and then gastrointestinal conditions as well. Um, so I started kind of hmm. noticing the link between those two things. I wrote, I wrote a whole bunch on it last semester. I wrote yeah. some papers on the links between religious and cultural sexual suppression and the nature of autoimmune disease. And I have a lot of theories that I would love to work with more in the future and hopefully get some funding for to do some actual research yeah. in how those two things are linked together. Um, so anyway, um, a lot of times I don't really have to give much advice, um, that's not my job. My job isn't okay. giving advice. It's giving permission hmm. because from my perspective, I, I don't have answers for you or for anyone. I've never had an answer for any woman that I've ever worked with. She already has all of her own answers. She doesn't have the permission to have access to those answers. She doesn't need that permission, but she doesn't know that she doesn't need that permission. So in holding a safe space of, non-judgmental conversation and she might think she's coming for me coming to me for advice or she might think that she's coming to me to get diet and lifestyle recommendations and the secret is is that what what's actually happening here is i'm interpreting for her a lot of what she's saying to me and i'm feeding it back to her through the lens of her lived experience what her body is trying to communicate to her so i have these pillars i have these tenants for the work that I do, because um, I, I wrote all, all, all of that out very recently in reshaping, completely restructuring the nature of the work that I do. And so I was asking myself those questions about who am I? What am I doing? What do I believe in? Who am I doing this for? Why do I believe that this is true? And within those tenets of, of why I am convinced that this is important and that it is potent and powerful and effective and it works is because I do believe that our bodies have a language and our, uh, that language of our bodies is our mother tongue and our lived experience of the things that separate us from ourselves that cut in things like sexual suppression, um, cut us off from having access to a fluency in that language a fluency that we, that is our birthright, that we're born with, that we're supposed to have, that when we're children, we have a very solid framework for, um, obviously barring significant trauma as a mm -hmm. child, but it is lived experience and trauma in any form, whether it's religious trauma syndrome. So you're assimilating to a narrative that isn't serving you in order to belong, um, or it's actual, you know, physically experienced trauma, like abuse, mm -hmm. um, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, anything like that. Mm -hmm. That trauma is what causes that rift and that breakdown in communication with your sense of being with your body. And my entire job is not to teach you how to talk to her again. All discovering is a remembering. So all that I have to do is hold space and do a little bit of work in interpreting because of the personal work that I've done and the things that I've learned is I have a, a little bit more of a fluency to, or a little bit more of a capability to know what I'm hearing when I hear it. And so my, a lot of my work is just to repeat things back similar to the, similarly to the way a relationship therapist between two human wow. like individuals that, that therapist sits in the middle and says, person A, I hear you saying this. Person B, do you hear them saying this? And they can often hear that coming from that mediator a lot better than they can from person A. Um, and so ultimately the bottom line is all from my perspective and, and the work that I do, all forms of illness, whether it's mental, physical, emotional, or spiritual, is dis-ease. It is literally dis-ease, being out of balance, being out of connection, out of integration, out mm -hmm. of fluency with your being and your body. And so bringing yourself back into a state where you are on the same team, like she's on your team, you're on her team and relearning how to communicate with her again and letting her know. And every time when I'm saying her, I mean, I'm referring to body, like right, your right. body yes. and, and referring kind of beginning to refer to her as a second person that you're in relationship with sort of. And so letting her know, sending these signals to her so that she knows that you are a safe person for her to be around now. 
because for many, many years, you were not a safe person for her to be around. Because you were ignoring what she was saying. You were ignoring, yes. And a lot of, and I would say the, the four main areas of the women that I work with, because um, it is young women, but it's also a lot of older women too. Um, I work with a, a many women who are older than me, um, even because the further you go in this process, the more kind of compounded it becomes and the more difficult it becomes to get out of it. Um, but these areas, the four main areas I work in are eating disorders, body dissociation, um, chronic illness, and sexual dysfunction. Mm. And for me, all four of those things flow together um, because all of those things are attributed, again, in my research and in my theories that I'm building on, all of those things are attributed to that breakdown in communication between your state of being, your sense of self, who you know that you are, and the permission for your body to be who she knows that she is too, and you being on the same team. Amazing. Floored. I am absolutely floored. <laughs> Thank you. For, for two reasons. Number one, I, I think this is something I need to hear, as a, mm. even as a man. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And not even like if one would have stooped down to your oh, level. Oh yeah. There's no like, question. Not at all. That I like, need to hear this, right? Like <clears throat> men need to get a hold of this stuff. Yes. We need to understand it as yeah. well right. and have a good relationship. I, with I mean, it, 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 purity culture does the same thing to men that it, yes. that it does to women, just to, probably to a lesser degree, but. And, and like places. in a different, it's a different, it's a different. I would just say lesser. It's just different. Different, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it, oh, and I'm sorry. The second thing, real yeah. quick, um, is I knew you before. Mm. I knew what you were passionate about, and I knew what you excelled in. Um, you were you were a leadership. You were doing worship, and you were doing all these different things. To see you now, I needed I needed to hear you speak today. Mm. And another reason is because. Um, seeing your strength now and the things that you're an expert in and the things that you're passionate about now in this, in your afterlife in your life after mm-hmm. um, is giving me hope for myself. Mm-hmm. Cause I was talking to you earlier today about how it's hard for me because I was so good in theology. I could, I could sit and talk about that stuff forever. Mm-hmm. And I knew the books, I knew the theologians, I knew the, all these different things, but when it, but now I feel like I've lost all of that and mm. I'm not really super good at anything mm-hmm. for the longest time. I was escapism into like television shows and I was an expert on that. But, um, you're encouraging me to find my next chapter mm-hmm. and what I need to do to move for my next life, mm-hmm. my next chapter. And I really, I, I appreciate you sharing that. Thank you. That yeah. that's, that's incredible. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. I, you're, like I said to you earlier, um, you're, that process is so important. That process of, of not knowing what to say, not knowing how to say it, not knowing why I'm here. What am I doing? I thought I had it all figured out. I thought I was excelling in this. That has to go. It has to go. Because like I just said in everything I even just explained of all discovering is remembering. The answers are already inside of you. That thing is already there. And that wound that you have is is your work. That wound is your work. It's in that area of your work. Your work is your wound. Your wound is your work. And that's, I, if there's, I don't know, if there's anything that I believe, I absolutely believe that. And when you're saying this now, and then even when we were talking earlier, I have no doubt in me at all that as painful as this process is for you, it being painful is actually the most important thing because that pain and that process is what gives you the ability to look at someone else and say, me too. Mm. I totally understand. Mm -hmm. I've been there before because without that, and I wrote it the other day, suffering is the only thing that truly creates an expert in any area. Mm. So Everything that I'm talking about now, it's so funny because I fully recognize that had it not completely fucked me up, had it not damaged me and almost, almost ended my life because of where I was three years ago at the bottom of all of this, had it not almost taken everything from me, I couldn't do this now. It's the only Mm. thing that got me to this point of this being me knowing that this is what I'm here for. And another weird thing is uh, now that I have left my faith and I am living as a more whole person, um, I can look at women as role models. 
Hmm. And that was oh, a weird wow. thing for me growing right. up. Right. Um, I, I remember even as oh, a kid, yeah. like reading I have a more book. women role, role models now than men role models. Yes, like my my Paul David trip turned into mm-hmm. Brene Brown. You mm-hmm. know, like just all these different people are. And, and even as a kid, I couldn't read a book if it had a female protagonist because it felt it felt weird. Yeah. You know. Wow. But yeah. now I'm like so much more in touch with myself sexually and who I am as a person. And um, I don't give a flying fuck if there's something that I see in anybody as a spark of. The divine or whatever you want to call it. Right. Um, I want to chase after that. Chuck, I, inter- I interrupted you earlier. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, no. I interrupted you and you interrupted me for interrupting Guys, I'm the you. woman at this table and I'm not apologizing. What's happening? The, <laughs> the Jamie, men I'm really here. sorry. We're, sorry. we're so sorry. I'm really this sorry. This is wonderful. We're so sorry. Can this happen more often? <laughs> sorry. If men could just fawn over themselves think, apologizing yeah. to me on a regular basis, I don't think basis, that anybody that should over apologize. <laughs> it's too late. I'm sorry. I was waiting for somebody to say I'm sorry. Jamie, um, so um, you you talked about um, this. Okay, so this kind of disassociation with your body. Mm -hmm. It starts with a wound, right? Yes. That's effectively what you're saying. Um, For me, uh, that wound was, was, uh, I think, I mean, it it goes back further than this probably, but Mm. I think where it really became a a powerful thing was when I... uh, started viewing pornography without like context to like communicate about what I was feeling or anything like that, you know? Um, and I was feeling shame about it. And, um, and I, I knew that it was wrong because the, because I was reading the Bible and and Jesus talks about plucking out your eyes and shit, you know? And it's like, I felt this like incredible guilt, but I didn't have any, there was no safe place for me to go with those feelings. Right. Um, are there, And this might be too too broad of a question, but are there are do you see patterns with those kinds of wounds? Like what what kind of kinds of things cause that? Do you do you get what I'm saying? Like for me, it was porn. For for you, mm-hmm. it was something. For Brady, it was something. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think that um, I'm going to be a broken record about the culprit again being fundamentalist religion yeah. because it paints everything as if black and white exists. Right. Um, and so uh, the majority of the damage comes either from individuals themselves feeling the pressure and the shame to assimilate to a black and white when they're feeling a lot of gray or people who have been abused or manipulated mm. by people who have convinced themselves that black and white are the only things that exist. Okay. And so there can be no gray. Wow. So it's one or the other. So you've either hurt yourself by having to assimilate to this belief okay. or someone else who has been damaged by their assimilating to that belief. The Again, it's kind of shaking that thing up and then it explodes. Right. And that's why I think a lot of the nature of a lot of sexual abuse Yeah, if we're going to continue from. having these conversations, you're going to watch your hand motions. <laughs> um, I'd really appreciate it. I re- that's true. I didn't think about that. <laughs> Well, no one can see it, but before we you know. wrap up, I I want to ask each and every one of us here at the table for some sex advice in general that you would just give to some of our listeners of things that you've learned in your life, um, it, it, as graphic or non graphic as you want, but just something that you could pass on to say, hey, whenever I have a teenage kid, <laughs> like these are the things that I would tell them, mm-hmm. um, or something like that. I think that would be beneficial because we didn't grow up with any of that. I learned about the birds and the bees from pornography, you know, um, we were always afraid of talking about these things. Chuck, what, what have you learned in your life that you'd like to pass? Oh on? gosh, so much Brady. <laughs> I've learned so many things. Um, but, uh, the big takeaway for me is that, uh, is that shame drives negative behavior. Yes. Um, mm. it, it is the, it is the, the source. Uh, it's not the source. It's the fuel that keeps it going. It's if, uh, if 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 what Jamie was talking about, if if abuse or or uh, um, oh, damn it, manipulation, manipulation. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't remember. Um, if abuse or, or manipulation or uh, or this black and white worldview is the is the it's the you turning the key and the engine starting the the fuel is mm. shame, um, mm. because you you uh, you you decide that you are sexually broken that you're that Mm. you're bad right and um and once you learn that then you are what else do you do you're bad you're you are bad so what do you do you do self-destructive things you Mm. uh, you do things that are destructive for other people yeah um and uh you don't need to feel shame about your sexual feelings um and uh 
it can be a process uh, to, to let go of shame. It can be shame is kind of a friend after a while. It's a, it's a companion, I guess. It's not really a friend, um, but, it's, but it's there. It's comfortable. Um, and uh, letting it go can be hard. It's like losing a, it's like losing a friend, however bad. Wow. And, um, but you have to, for your, for your own sake, you, uh, you have to let it go. You have to decide, no, I'm, um, I'm, I'm whole and, and, and how I feel is important. And, um, I have nothing to be ashamed of. Mm. I'm a sexual, I'm a sexual person and we all because are. Because I'm a person. And we are, right. <laughs> yeah. I am a, I'm a human. Mm-hmm. And, um, whatever it is that, that you're ashamed of is, it's probably fine. My sexuality grew out, grew out of that. Like a, mm. like a, you know, a flower in a garden that was being nurtured for the first time when I was like 26, you know, wow. still has all of its petals, right? <laughs> it's in fact <laughs> thriving, growing more petals. The petals are it's a mutant flower. It's a, <laughs> with so many petals. I'm sorry. I like that. It is though. Yeah. It's getting a little out of control and I like it. Brady in the best way. Yes. What kind of sex advice would you, would Brady. you give? Um, I think mine would definitely be that you, you are fine being yourself, damn it. Um, you know, really just fighting off, feeling like I wasn't good enough because I, I still was attracted to men. Um, and, and, you know, I, I was being brought up and told that it was a choice. It was a choice that I was making. And then, you know, then later on, you know, I had other more savvy Christians would come along and would say, well, you know, it's not a choice uh, to have those temptations, but it is your choice to act upon them. And so there's, there's always going to be a level of shame that people are going to give you. And when you uh, quote, give into that, and in other words, you are a whole person. You are being a whole person that um, that listens to your own instincts and does what you know is right for yourself. Um, you're you're gonna get you're gonna get shamed. You're gonna get shit for it, but uh, it's worth it. And just be yourself. Just go with it. Um, whenever you go through that, it's not that you're not enough. And I followed the rules. I did everything that I was supposed to do. I saved myself for marriage. I, I didn't touch a man sexually until after my marriage. I didn't, you know, didn't do all this stuff. Um, I, I asked the court, I asked for marriage and, uh, asked her family for those things. But our, our marriage went to shit really, really quickly. Um, and I was attracted to her and she knew I was transparent with people of what I was and who I was. There's no other way that I could have handled, uh, me being gay better than I did practically. Right. And even if I didn't, there's still grace for everybody. Um, and there should be, and I'm not talking about religious grace. I'm talking about real human to human, um, look at you straight in the eye and say that I love and respect you. That sort of grace. Um, I did what I was supposed to in the promises that I was given through purity culture and through patriarchy and through, uh, all, all of the upbringing that I had. Um, those promises were false um, I want to call them lies, but I don't think they were intentional. I associate the word lies with intention. I think that it's been through a process of of years and years and years of self-righteousness and passing those ideology down to generation to generation. It's created a very manipulative um, ideology that people want to hold on to because they were told that it was right and those people were told that it was right and those They're people so were told They're so desperate for it to be true mm-hmm. that they have to keep telling the story that it is. Yes. And they write the stories that it is. Yes. They write the stories. If you've got two people that are in a relationship together and it's working out and they're going to attribute it to, well, this process worked. Yes. Um, it, but then you have to ignore all of the other people who don't have that process right. and their relationship's yeah. working out great. Yeah. And then you have to work around like, oh, well, they don't really love each other because they don't have God or like, you know, it's just be the image of God, the uh, Dios and whatever that is called. And like, you know, that God just puts his graces and it's just common grace that they're, no, it, it's because they're fucking people and that they are whole people and they're are doing what is right for them that their bodies mm-hmm. and their wholeness are telling them to do um don't spiritualize that for them it's not yeah, fair right. um it's not right and you're robbing you're robbing humanity of their ability of taking care of itself mm-hmm. um that would be my advice jamie, jamie. um last but not least <laughs> mm. saving the best for last oh boy um well it's interesting to me in the question that was asked technically the question on the table was Sex, like sex advice 
And you talked about shame and you talked about owning your identity completely. Mm. And what is so interesting to me is I would call that not so much sexual intelligence as I would call it erotic intelligence. Ooh, okay. So erotic intelligence is, I won't say it's my thing because it's not my thing as Chuck does a little shimmy. Um, it's not my thing. It's, it's a thing that I'm becoming increasingly more passionate about as I'm learning more from people who know more than me. One of those individuals being Esther Perel and her work. Um, <clears throat> and so when it, so to explain what erotic intelligence is, which my main piece of advice, apart from have a whole lot of sex, which would be my sex advice, mm-hmm. my, like that my advice. blanket statement sex advice is, is permission. It's you are not waiting for permission. Mm. Is That's my sex advice, is have a lot of sex, consensual sex, good sex with whoever you want to, whenever you want to, wherever you want to, however you want to, just do that. Because when you've been hanging out in restriction for your entire life, you have to spend a whole lot of time. You have to balance that that out. The pendulum has to swing in the other direction in order mm. to find the healthy middle. It can't just automatically find its way to the middle. You have to go from one extreme, hang out in the other, and trust that your body's going to tell you when we are done with, we're done with all and only permission. We're now coming back to integration. Trust your body. Trust that. And that's, that's a work that I can help people in knowing what that sounds like, how to hear your body say that. So my point blank, very simple sex advice is have sex. <laughs> really that. simple. Yeah. But when it comes to what you guys are talking about with <clears throat> your, my, my, advice in the realm of eroticism, which I think is so much more important, which is actually what you two are talking about. Because the erotic is the life force in you. It's what is alive in you. And because of the messages we received about our inability to integrate ourselves with our sexual expression and our sexual identity, there is a lot of residual, there's a lot that happens from that that is a residual effect that we are very shut down to what makes us feel alive because our sexual expression, sex, the reality of sex and sexuality is it's it's a part of you feeling alive with your partner or with yourself or however that expresses itself with multiple partners. Um, So when it comes to cultivating erotic intelligence and so that you can find erotic compatibility, there is a whole lot of work that people don't even realize is, is an option for them to do in figuring out what makes them feel alive. And when you do that work to find out what makes you feel alive, um, and I don't just mean in a, I, it's our culture has turned the idea of the erotic into a, a sexual idea. And really, it's, it's not necessarily just that. So if you think about something that makes you feel alive, for me, going running makes me feel really alive. When I see something, when I see a beautiful sunset, it makes me feel alive. All of those things. Um, that is me becoming more in touch with myself, with my own eroticism. Wow. Yes. And so doing that work, um, finding, and then if you want to go on a deeper level with that, if you want to bring in the realm of sexuality, um, recognizing for myself that I need, when it comes to relationships and coupling, um, I actually need distance and I need space in order to feel alive. So, I actually need something. The idea of marriage is really hard for me to wrap my head around because I need space from my partner in order to make me desire my partner. Mm. That if you're constantly accessible to me, I actually don't desire you in that way. Um, that isn't, through, through learning more about this, I have come to the point of being able to give myself the permission to recognize that that's not a flaw in me that needs to be fixed. That's actually just compatibility that I need to find. That's possible. It's possible to couple with someone, to build something with someone where that empty space is built in between the two of us to where we have separate work that we do, but we also are coupled with one another and we're building something together. So this is all kind of convoluted, but, um, I would say, My best, my best sex advice would be have a lot of sex. My best erotic advice would be find out what makes you feel alive. Because when you do that work to actually, you're fully occupying your body, you're fully occupying yourself, you know why you're here, or at least you feel like you're kind of 
pulling at that threat. You, you have a sense of it. You're like on the trail of like, I think I know why I'm here and you are alive and you also experiment with self-pleasure and you experiment with, you know, autonomous erotic, uh, autonomous erotic expression, um, buy a fucking vibrator, watch, watch some porn if that's what you need. Like if you experiment with those things and you know what makes you come alive in period in general, and then also in a sexual setting, you are then able to enter into a sexual experience with a partner being fully present and being fully present in that experience so that the other person is able to have, you can cater to the other person. Um, you are there to, to hear what they have to tell you and to meet their needs, fully knowing that you know how to have your needs met too because you've done the work to figure out what your needs are. Um, so maybe this doesn't translate super well into some like very simple, what's my best advice? No, um, that's, that's, that's fantastic. But that there are, makes perfect sense to yeah, me. there are people, I'm learning a lot about it right now. I'm by no means an expert with any of it, but there are a lot of people who know more than me, the foremost of which I would say would be Esther Perel, um, who has a really incredible book called Mating in Captivity, which Ooh. talks a lot about this. Before we wrap up, um, on one of the breaks, you had mentioned kind of an illustration of how to interpret pornography mm -hmm. and the two different uses of it. Before we wrap up, do you mind um, kind of giving us a really quick illustration on that? And then mm -hmm. that will be the end of our podcast for yeah. today. <laughs> Let's just end on porn, guys. Yeah. It feels good. <laughs> That's um, right. Well, it wouldn't be the first time. So for, I'll, you know, I'll back up a little bit with, with content. <laughs> That was good. <laughs> I didn't even catch that. It took me a second. To, to, to bolster it with some context, I think that um, pornography has definitely gotten, and sex work in general, has gotten a really unfortunate reputation, both from religion and from our culture, for being blanket statement, all bad, no matter what. It's not healthy. Um, <clears throat> and I think that that's a tragic disservice to the possibilities of the erotic. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also doing a whole lot of damage for people. And even, you know, back in my days inside of the church and hanging out with all this men that I dated who felt the need to confess to me that they struggled with pornography and as if that was right. something I should or can keep them accountable for. Right. And first of all, that's some weird boundaries there. Absolutely. Um, when you're dating someone, yeah. um, huge. And you're not, a, that's a, a weird very, boundary a when you're not, on the, on it the, is. And it's strange when you're not actually engaging with that person sexually. <laughs> and then yes, there's, yes. yeah. So it's really strange. Um, so I think that there is a lot of damage that's done to men, um, by being told that there's something wrong with them for being interested in or engaging with pornography. <clears throat> and I think that the observing, visually observing sexual acts is not the problem. Um, I think that there are people like Cindy Gallup who is pioneering the website makelovenotporn.tv um, where among many of the goals that she has and what she's doing, one of them is for us as human beings to observe what real life sex with real life couples looks like. Um, all different types of bodies, all different types of sexual orientations, all different types of gender orientations. It, it, just watching, watching the experience, because if that is erotic to you, if visually observing sexual acts is something that's erotic to you, um, that is okay. That's absolutely okay. But you kind of have to, the, the problem, that's not the problem. The problem is, is when we are given these highly edited, um, very specific versions through a lot of what pornography is that says that this is what sex looks like and sex only looks like this. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> my, I'm coughing into your microphone. Are you doing great? My, um, my illustrator, I don't know if it's my illustration, but my theory, so to speak on that is the use of pornography is much like the use of a chemical substance that the differentiation, it's the differentiation of a chemical substance between a medicine and a drug. There are three things that are the factors that differentiate between whether or not a chemical substance is a medicine, whether or not it's a drug. Obviously, there are exceptions to this, um, like heroin. That's never going to be a medicine. Mm -hmm. But um, I'll just give the context for when this, when I started playing with this idea in my head is when I had a real gnarly sinus infection uh, a few months ago, and I was prescribed Sudafed. And 
going to the clinic to pick up that medicine, knowing that you have to, you can, you have to sign a thing. You have to hand over your ID. You're only allowed, you're not allowed to get any refills. You're only allowed to have it during a certain period of time. They're very protective of this medicine because people use it for a drug. And so I started thinking about that and the fact that this is one of those that kind of straddles the line. It's both medicine and drug, depending on depending on what was the question, depending right. on what, because I'm sick right now. And so I need this. So <clears throat> without giving it away on the front end, basically what I kind of came to realize um, is that the thing that differentiates between, or the, the three things that differentiate between something being a medicine and something being a drug, something serving you and then you serving it. Mm -hmm. The difference between those two is number one, the nature of the substance itself, the nature of the thing itself. So because I was sick and the type of specific sickness that I had, my doctor prescribed to me the appropriate medication, the appropriate chemical substance for it. So the nature of what I had been prescribed and what I was putting into my body, what I was taking in was appropriate for what I was experiencing. It was the right thing. Now contrast that to where if I had had a certain kind of sickness, and I was taking, I don't know, I don't really know a good example for this, but if I had a headache and I just started pounding NyQuil, that's a problem. Right. Like that's not, right, right, you right. can't call that medicine that is dipping into the realm of drug. Um, Cause I'm, it's not serving me, but in some weird way I'm serving it. Right. So that's the first thing is the nature of the substance itself. The second thing would be the state that the person is in, the state that you are in when you're taking in that substance. So because I was sick, it was medicine. If I was well and I still had that Sudafed and I was taking it every day, something's wrong with that because I'm dependent on this thing that's not doing the job that it was originally intended to do for me. It was originally intended to do a job to make me well. Well, now I'm well, so what is it doing? It's not it's not doing what it was supposed to do and there's some there's some and that's where you get into the whole realm of like quote unquote, perfectly healthy people who don't have sinus infections are boiling this down and shooting it up and that's where it becomes Math. Um, so it's the state that you are in when you're taking it, taking in that substance. And then the third thing is the amount that you take in. So on the box of that Sudafed, it had the directions of how much I'm supposed to take. If I keep to those directions and I'm like, cool, this is the appropriate amount that my body needs to battle what it needs to battle. Great. If I took double or triple that amount, it would harm me. It would start to harm me. And I think that's the kind of language, now that I hit that and said that, that's the kind of language that I feel I need to be expressing in my differentiating between medicine and drug is when something's helping you and something's harming you. So that the linking that all the way back around to something like pornography or visually observing sexual acts, um, it can either help you. That is absolutely a possibility that that is something that is erotic for you for you personally or for you and your partner. I mean, there's countless stories that you never hear inside of, you know, these controlled narratives of couples who that's, that's an erotic experience for them to watch porn together. Um, but of course you never hear about that, but so that helps them, that helps them to connect with one another. That helps some individuals to connect with themselves. But then there is this whole other realm where, you know, people like Russell Brand have talked about where it, it, kind of rewires some stuff inside your brain. And so it can become harmful. You're right. It absolutely can become harmful. But it's those three things that I would say you have to ask yourself the question of what's the nature of what I'm taking in, which is why I support so much what Cindy Gallup is doing, because the nature of the quote unquote substance itself, a lot of what we're getting from the pornography industry is very, it's a very unhealthy over idealized right, right. version of what sex is and what sex the purpose of sex right, is for right. so observing if that's erotic to you maybe signing up for make love not porn tv would be a better idea than signing up for something like pornhub right. the nature of it is healthier the nature of it is potentially less harmful for what you're observing because it's not wrong that it's erotic it's not wrong so and then the next one being the state that you're in when you have it are you in a healthy place 
Are you wanting to explore more from a place of curiosity and not from a place of loneliness and sadness and depression? Mm -hmm. Are you and your partner in a good, healthy place with one another? Are you and your partner, have you communicated about this being something that might serve the both of you? Or are you so disconnected from your partner right now that you're actually needing pornography as an expression in order to release that sexual energy that you're not feeling safe and that intimate energy that you're not feeling safe to express with your partner? So what kind of state are you in mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually even when you're taking in this substance when you're using it in the first place. And then the third one being the amount that you consume, which I think is something that the main thing that I've heard from people like Russell Brand, because I super respect him and what he's talking about. And a lot of, and his story, kind of his point is it was something that he became addicted to. He was addicted to it. So the nature of you're not addicted to medicine, you're addicted to a drug. And if you are addicted to medicine, it is a drug. That's when it becomes a drug. So the amount that you're taking, your dependency upon it, are you dependent on, upon that substance? Are you dependent on porn in order to get off? Are you so dependent on that visual, visual observation of sexual acts that when you are in a sexual experience with someone else, with another individual, or if you're even attempting to self-pleasure, is it impossible for you to just do that on your own? Is it impossible for you to fully mentally and emotionally occupy that experience? Is it impossible for you to fully occupy that space with that other person? Are, are, are you dependent? Are, is literally your phys- physiological reaction in order to have a sexual experience dependent upon watching porn? Because you've mm-hmm. desensitized yourself so much. So I I have a very, and I won't even get into the sex work thing right now because I have a lot of very specific beliefs. Of, sure. It's ironic because I, this time 10 years ago, had helped start a nonprofit that works towards ending sex trafficking in Southeast Asia. And they're still going and I still believe in it. But a lot of the language I used back then was blanket statement vilification of sex work altogether. And I absolutely do not believe that that's healthy or appropriate. Um, so sex work is a whole nother thing, but so I don't, I don't think anyone's doing anyone else any favors by saying that pornography or again, you know, just visual observation of sexual acts, um, is altogether bad. I think that it can be, and is for a lot of people erotic and they don't have access to or permission to being able to know and acknowledge that that's something that works for them and is healthy for them and is helpful for them. Because if it's just altogether restricted, they don't get the opportunity to ask themselves those questions and they just automatically go to those places where they say, well, I must be a bad person because I'm interested in this at all. Well, that's amazing. I I'm I could talk about porn for a really long time. <laughs> You'll have to cut me off. <laughs> right. No, that that was it's it's such a it's such an important um thing to deconstruct and honestly I think that um even I mean even after I left Christianity I had all of these like looming questions about the nature of porn and like whether it was a good or bad thing and and I've been exploring that so this is like uh, a really pertinent conversation for me so thank you and I'm sure yeah. I'm not the only one not at I'm, all. Sh- I'm sure I probably most people that are leaving <laughs> church on some level have this this question right so yeah and that's i think that that um is ultimately bottom line broken record about it is why fundamentalism is so toxic um, because it keeps you from access to your own intuitive wisdom and your own body knowledge your own body wisdom and they're absolutely like you express there are absolutely times when you're engaging with something like pornography and you, you feel like your full self is there, yeah. your full self is there. And this is a healthy thing for you right now. It's a part of your erotic and sexual and intimate expression. And then there are other times when you access that exact same thing. And because of those three things, the nature and the amount yes. and the state, yes. it is suddenly, you, it registers deep in your gut, deep in your being as this, this is, is not, not okay right me. now. Right. And yeah. fundamentalism doesn't give you the opportunity to be in touch with that part of yourself to know when it's good and when it's not good. Right. So it's going when back it's healthy, to when listening it's not healthy. to your body, listening knowing. to your body, listening to your space, or listening to yourself, creating that space to listen to yourself. And that's why, you know, in the nature of the work that I do with women is I, my primary job is to hold that space. Um, and, help you learn how to get rid of those rules and know that you no, there's no external force. There's no outside force that's going to be able to tell you how to live more appropriately than your own state of being is already trying to give you the clues 
It was like, this is how you're supposed to mm. live. This week on Facebook, I had a conversation with somebody on this and, and it was about releasing these fundamental beliefs and not having a religion. And they mm-hmm. asked like, well, what do you replace it with? Like, what, what are you going to listen to? What external thing are you going to listen to? And I think that the answer is, is absolutely right of what you've been saying is listening to your own body, listening to your, mm-hmm. your have a wholeness and to grasp onto that. Um, I want to thank you so much, Jamie, for letting us come to your house and record with you and hear your stories. Um, I know that our listeners are going to love this and it's going to be really helpful. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thank um, you. That's the end of our <clears throat> episode. We're going to go ahead and wrap up. Thank you all very much for listening. Um, I'm Brady Harden and with me is Chuck and Jamie. Uh, Jamie, where can people find you? Um, well, I have a presence as far as the writing that I do and the poetry that I do. I have a presence on Facebook and on Instagram, and then I'm just really sassy on Twitter about anything and everything. Um, so I am, it, everything is just at Jamie Lee Finch. Um, as far as professionally and what I've referred to in the work that I do with women, um, I do take clients as an integrative health coach and as that relationship therapist between women and their own bodies. And I fully expect that there's a lot of people that have been a lot of women that have been listening to this, our conversation today, who are thinking, how do I get to that place? How do I access that? What do I do? How do I quite literally unfuck my brain from purity culture? Um, are your clients only in Nashville area? No, I take clients from all over the world. The majority of my clients have actually been remote. Um, I do free consultations. So if anyone wants to get in touch with me from any of those mediums, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, um, facebook.com slash Jamie Lee Finch poet oh they search if they search jamie lee finch yeah they'll find you yeah um yeah so people can get in touch with me women can get in touch with me from any of those mediums i've taken clients from getting in touch with me from any of those mediums just saying can i talk to you more about this and then we start working together um i'm deeply passionate about this i think that it can literally save women's lives it can heal their bodies it can heal their minds it can heal their spirits Mm -hmm. um so i would definitely urge anyone out there who is curious about this and just wants to know more about it or just wants to have a conversation with me i would love to have a conversation with you um and just create that safe space for you to talk about what your experience has been perfect thank you so much thanks guys thanks jamie I have trouble treading lightly. My steps have only ever echoed in the stairwells of cathedrals, high heels, and holy places. She's not a sight or sound for the sacred, or so I'm told. And it's better that you know this now, in case you're searching for someone to keep you safe instead of keeping you honest. There isn't a day of my life I haven't made an entrance, so don't take me anywhere any version of you would like to be invited to again. Don't let me anywhere any version of you would prefer unchallenged or unchanged because my impropriety is alchemy, honey, and settling for silver just isn't me.